Hey, Richard, welcome. We're so <laughs> glad you made our, our fast break series here in the month of October as we head to the fall. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, it's good to have you here. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this, Richard, but we uh, we have a Liverpool office um, and uh, they are big, big time uh, soccer fans. Um, so uh, could you just give us a quick two seconds on what happened to you guys this last weekend? Well, I, I, I think that uh, as anybody who's followed Liverpool will know, we've probably had the most dominant team in, in Europe for the last 12 months, which was pretty much the way um, uh, it was when I grew up in Liverpool. And I think that it's it's uh, makes, makes it such a shock when we stumble. So we're, we're all hoping there was a bit of a blip there, uh, a little bit of a loss of concentration. And we still feel like we did better than Manchester United last weekend. So oh. I suppose on balance, not all that bad. All right, all right, all right. That's good. You just you basically just offended everybody other than Liverpool for the last 30 seconds. That's awesome. Uh, so before we get started, I just wanted to just give everybody kind of a quick overview on who Reputation is, for those of you that are new, um, to, to just knowing who we are. And um, so I thought I'd give a, a quick commercial here in terms of who we are. We're about 450 employees. We have, as I just mentioned, the Liverpool office, um, but we have global coverage, um, offices uh, all over the world. Uh, we are all about helping companies communicate with their customers. And that's the important piece here. Uh, and we do it at scale. So as you see here, 40 million surveys. Uh, we've got 31 patents. We manage about 3 billion points of feedback throughout the world. Uh, and we've introduced reputation experience management uh, the, in 2000, uh, late 2019, early 2020. And as you can see there, our origins go all the way back to 2006, but the current company, reputation.com, actually started in 2013. These are the companies that we work with, uh, and we take great pride in having uh, amazing relationships, whether it's auto, whether it's property management, whether it's incredible healthcare, uh, frontline workers. Um, and then if you look at what we've done in the G G2 world in terms of having customers talk about us, uh, the quick commercial there is, is that we uh, are often ranked the highest uh, in our categories uh, because it's really important to us that we not only do that, but we we make sure that we are the type of company that can communicate with our customers and that our customers say great things about us, which is kind of why Richard and I are here today uh, to talk a little bit about CX programs and the origin of MPS. So Richard, maybe you could just give us a couple minutes on what you're doing with your company right now and a little bit of the origin of MPS for those people that don't uh, have not used a net promoter score or a little bit of background on it. Certainly. So let, let's talk a little bit, a bit about the history of the Net Promoter Score. Uh, so in my previous life running a company called Satmetrics, my team there led by the uh, brilliant Dr. Laura Brooks and working with Fred Reichel, the Bain & Company, created the Net Promoter Score methodology around about 2003, which was really one big simple idea, which was the companies that could demonstrate higher levels of loyalty with their customers we're going to outperform in terms of financial performance. They were growing much faster, which sounds completely obvious to all, us all today, but was sort of first time it was really empirically expressed. And back then, Net Promoter Score was really a great business concept. What if you could measure this? What if you could sort of move forward sure. with that? What happened over the next uh, four or five years was as it gained adoption, it became much more of a robust business methodology. And we worked with you know, 6,000 companies ultimately adopted this methodology that we developed uh, as a product, essentially, to go out there and start to do a more robust approach. And so it moved from being a simple metric to being a more robust methodology. It started to become much more sophisticated within companies, and it became a sort of way of life for a lot of companies. And today, I would say that still, uh, you know, uh, 10, 20 percent of companies do a really good job of doing this. A lot of other companies do a very simplistic version of this where they maybe survey a few customers. Um, and the future, which is really what we're excited about uh, with this new venture, is really applying the next generation technology to all of this. So moving away from being a dominated by survey approach to being a dominated by machine learning predictive analytics approach. So yeah, rather than 
ask a customer whether they're a promoter, can you predict a customer whether they're a promoter? And yes, you can. And can you do that every single day for every single customer? Yes, you can. So you don't wait once a year to get a response to a survey. You get every piece of information all the time. Yeah, that's a great point because I think one of the biggest things um, that we've noticed at reputation.com, because we obviously do uh, both solicited and <clears throat> unsolicited feedback, is that people on the MPS side that just do simple surveys, as you just mentioned, they don't want to wait a whole year. You know, you've got to be more interactive. And if you're waiting, even 30 days sometimes could be too long right. to react to a customer uh, issue. I, I, I would just tell you this, that one of our customers is Westfield Malls. And, uh, you know, the whole world is about trying to figure out how to adjust to COVID-19 and to try to figure out, you know, on the fly how people could be made to feel safer. And what they were seeing in their surveys would take too long. But what they were seeing in their unsolicited reviews were people were like, hey, you need to have all workers at this mall wearing masks and we need to make sure we feel safe. Almost like you want to smell the, you know, the, uh, the cleaning fluid. <laughs> but that's a good example, Richard, of where yeah. people want kind of real time. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with um, some of your customers. I know you've worked with Experian. Maybe give us a little bit of a quick update there. So, so companies in, in this instance, business to business, uh, as you say, time is of the essence. If you have an issue with a large account that's got a material impact, you want to understand if that was a problem yesterday or this morning, not six months ago when you surveyed them. So what we do is we look at the operational performance of those com customers through a, through a data exhaust that the company typically has. And we use that to anticipate whether that customer is a promoter, passive, or detractor, and get that to sales teams the moment something changes so that they can react instantly. So we're really buying time. And it's, it's like the example you gave with Westfield. In some ways, you know, the surveys are the buggy whip of our universe. And, <laughs> you know, it was a great technology. What's the buggy system. whip? Is that, a, is that a UK term for a buggy whip? Buggy whip a horse and cart, right? You know, it's, it's, uh, you know it's, 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 it's ancient technology. And we sort of took... Surveys from the 60s, which were clipboards, <laughs> and, and we basically said, let's make them on the web. So we have web-based clipboards. Yeah. And, and it's a bit like saying, look, I, you know, I, I took a, a car from the 1950s, shoved the battery in it, and I have a Tesla, right? It's not really the point. We're, we're dealing with an, a, an old technology that's limited because customers, let's face it, are limited in their capacity to respond to surveys. So social media is exciting because... It has that immediacy. It has that real-time informational component to it. It's also exciting because it's what customers want to do. They want to give feedback through terms like social media. Sure, and it's funny and, you that up because the uh, I think you and I both agree. When MPS was first created, the uh, what I'll call the real-timeness of social media wasn't really around. And so when you start to think about you know, the different forms of, of media. I'll just give you guys an example here. You probably start to think about, you know, not only just the social platform, but you've got text messaging, <laughs> you've got Google My Business, like there's actual communication that goes through Google My Business now. Uh, there is the call center, there's chat. I mean, when you look at all this stuff, Richard, and you start thinking about how it impacts today's MPS, what are, what are some of your thoughts? Well, so the first observation you made, which was the key one, is that we have vast more data resources than we had 20 odd years ago. Sure. And so we were sort of inventing our own data asset 20 years ago by saying, let's survey people. Now we're looking at data assets that are within the business already because they're being generated from all these sources or they're being generated from internal information about how customers are actually behaving. So the challenge becomes less one of, uh, can we find data or do we have to originate data? What the heck do we do with all this data? And perhaps a better question, how do we make sense of it? How do we turn that into indications of behavior of customers, right? And what you do with the reputation score, what you do with NPS, these kind of metrics and how you combine these kind of metrics and data sets together becomes the real insight that tells you how you can act. So. You know, you can sort of be stuck in this old world of thinking we're still back in 2000, where we have to sort of go off there and sort of, you know, go on the high street with a clipboard asking people about things. 
<laughs> or you can try and tackle the issue of how do you get capitalized on this amazing opportunity created by all of this data that's available. Yeah. And think about this way. I think it's interesting. You know, the the MPS is a one way communication. If you're, if you're just using surveys and you're just asking simple questions, it's like a very structured format to get feedback. If you start looking at all the, the areas of unsolicited feedback, like a quick review of that doctor after you did the visit or a quick review of the service department after you have your car serviced, these are the types of things that when you combine them with uh, solicited feedback, you can actually start to marry both MPS uh, promoter score and the reputation score. Um, and for those of you who don't know what the reputation score is, uh, it is basically a metric that we use that's built industry specific. So it's actually different. Uh, think of it as a FICA score that you get for credit. Um, but this is actually the combination of how well you're doing on all of your unsolicited areas of feedback. So when I showed that slide a little earlier, it could be your reviews, it could be your social posting, it could be feedback that you're getting from the uh, from the call center. And basically you pull all that together and we create a reputation score that's industry specific so you can measure yourself in the industry. And I know in MPS, you guys did similar things in terms of being able to measure yourself against other people in that in that industry as well. Maybe you could expand a little bit on that. Well, well, what we do know is that all performance is relative to within industries, so right? True. Because at the end of the day, there's you know pe people read a book and they say, well, I'd like an NPS like Apple's NPS. Apple has 80. Well, yeah. if you're going to go off and build a smartphone and compete with Apple, that's a really important idea. But the reality is a winning score in, say, telecommunications could be zero. And I, I'm not being facetious. I'm not knocking telco companies. Right. There's it's that big a difference. <laughs> that's a bigger difference. And yeah. so... You know, you have to think of it in the context of your industry. And you, now that there's one thing that's changed, though, Joe, and I think it's interesting. Yeah. So we used to say this five years ago and we say, look, it's it's outrunning the other guy, right? The other guy may be terrible. You may be just better than them, but you're in the lead. Two things have changed around that. First of all, customer expectations aren't necessarily calibrated on your competitors in your industry. Right. So you, the number of guys you'll talk to in business to business, for example, will say, our customers think our web operations should be as good as Amazon because sure. that's the standard. So now you're competing emotionally with a standard that's set by Amazon. Sure. Secondly, if you're in an industry which has low NPS or low performance, low reputation scores, and you don't react to that just because your competitors are even worse, you'll get new entrants. And so you see this playing out, for example, in the financial services industry very, very clearly. So traditional banks never had great performance, right. but they were relatively great because everybody sort of wasn't that good. Yeah, well, that's a great point, by the way. So you say again? Well, no, we see the same thing in reputation score. Like the, sure. the financial services is a very low uh, reputation score. That whole industry... Uh, so it's funny that, you know, it's funny as you and I go through this, we probably have a lot of between MPS and reputation score uh, similarities. Oh, absolutely. It's certainly an industry level. And so you look at that industry that for years sat around saying, well, you know what, our score wasn't very good, but the other guy down the street, <laughs> he's even worse, right? A bit, bit like Liverpool and Manchester United last weekend. <laughs> now, on Stop the other it. hand, though, the problem is that some new entrants, so if you look at Europe, for example, you see... Revolut or a new fintech company here in the States, Robinhood, obviously is going to have to brokerage, yeah, shows up and says, look, all the incumbents stink. <laughs> We're going to start a whole new business that, that really is so much better. And so that's the risk from being in an industry where everybody is poor. Yeah. It's, and it's really, it's a great example. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing now is that uh, for senior living, People want to put their grandparents, their parents in really well-respected senior living facilities. So uh, I'm looking at unsolicited feedback. You know, we went through a pretty tough time with our mother-in-law and it was a memory care facility. And we looked at all of the reviews, all of the things that we could see. And that's a just a basic consumer right. feedback, you know, and it's really important. Um, and that's where I think 
the, you know, it's interesting for the, the power of the consumer, right? Well, Joe, the, the, the fact is, you know, I, I have joke about this, but 30 years ago, people would write a letter to the CEO. Dear sir, I am outraged by the level of service I got. And you'd put a postage stamp on it, you'd mail it in, and it's the true. company would sum summarily ignore it. And now, of course, what you do is you've, you've realized that social media is your megaphone. And we're actually training people to understand they're gonna get better service by going on social. And this is a problem uh, because they say, we set up all these apparatus in the contact center to be efficient, and then we're not very good at it. So customers give up on it and they simply broadcast on social because they know the social teams will be more responsive. Sure. But you're also playing to the fact that uh, unprompted feedback through social is really how customers want to communicate. Yes. Their preference. So. You know, let's try and make our programs more friendly to what our customers would like. How about that? And yeah, go yeah. where they want to go. <laughs> That's like one of the things that we have in our uh, rep score for providers, healthcare providers, is this thing called uh, bedside manner. And, I, you know, come on, man. 30 years ago, no one was ranking a doctor's bedside manner because no one ever got any bedside manner. Right. So now you can look real time. Um, anyways, well, let's switch the topic a little bit. How about? If we think about successful uh, CX programs, I mean, if you think about the origin of MPS and all of the work that you've done over the years around CX programs, and then you think about a little bit what we're doing, I think this is a good uh, encapsulation of you know the fundamental pillars. Maybe you could kind of take people through it a little bit. I know with feedback, we already kind of did that a little bit, but maybe let's get your opinions on you know the the three pillars here. Yeah, so, so I think in general, what we've seen over a long period of time is the cost and effort associated with data collection has sort of prevented people doing anything else. You know, at the end of the year, they collapse exhausted and said, oh, we managed to, we managed to get some data pulled together. When the value chain clearly favors insight, right? what people want, what business leaders want is what can they learn from the data, especially, and I know it's such a tired phrase to say actionable insight, but at the end of the day, it's got to be practical for a business. What is it you can change about your operation that's going to result in a change in, in performance? And, and this big topic, the big C word, culture, which is kind of scary, but what we know is companies that have this thing, culture, uh, outperform companies that don't by a mile. And pretty much if you don't have the right customer-centric culture, everything else is a waste of time. So in some ways... We're using data, whether it's reputational data, whether it's data gleaned from, from surveying or whatever have you, to shape culture, to shape people's behavior. And we're all, we've all sort of become quasi-behavioral engineers, right? How do we get customer-facing teams? How do we get employees to do something you know, just different enough to make a difference? And you know, I think personally that the guy who, of anyone I've ever met is the best at this was the uh, uh, Horst Schultze who founded the Ritz-Carlton hotel chain, who was a master at human engineering. And what made Ritz-Carlton superb was the level of detail put into how the teams, the employees engage with customers. And that wasn't by accident, that was prescriptive. They took what they learned and they turned it into processes and they turned it into action. So the cultural part's a big deal. It is. And I think the, uh, wow, great example with Ritz. I think you see a little bit of that in the legacy of Nordstrom as well. Um, customer yeah. service, caring for people. Um, but it's interesting as you talk about that, you know, I think one of the trends we're seeing is that, you know, you're right. Everybody's spent all their time collecting data. Well, what are you going to do with it? Right. And so I think one of the things that I think you and I need to talk about is, you know, uh, as technology is getting better and we're starting to present these machine learning platforms like a reputation.com or whatever you've seen out there in your own side. What do you think is the, you know, the perfect complement between MPS and the, and the unsolicited feedback? I mean, give us a little bit of your thoughts on how you yeah. see that moving uh, over time. So, so I think that ev everything is converging on this idea that you need an integrated view of the customer. Sure. Right. And, and to do that, you need a, a simple level. You need your data sources, the raw data. You need to find a way to access it. And then you need to be able to pull that data together into a handful of 
analytics that cut through all of the raw data and mm. give directional indicators for you as a business, right? Because to make it usable, it needs to be directional and it needs to come together at the customer level. So I think the challenge for all of us is to find ways to build those right sets of metrics and to be able to pull them together and make them usable. And I think the mistake that a lot of teams are making right now, whether they're machine learning teams or data science teams or what have you, is that they, they don't necessarily understand how to organize all that data so it makes sense. So that, that domain to pull it all together to make sense of it's gonna be where people focus. Now, the, uh, at the end of the rainbow, Joe, the exciting thing here is given all the data that's available, we should be able to arm organizations and their teams with an incredibly direct, straightforward, uh, directional sense of how their customers are performing and what they need to do immediately to improve that performance. Now, it's not going to be you know, super simple. Uh, it's not just going to be a traffic light, but it will be a data set that's, that's incredibly powerful for organizations to understand. If we can get there, I think you're going to see a real meaningful change in business behavior across, across these businesses. Yeah, I think you know one of the things that we've been doing is trying to figure out how to combine an MPS score with a um, uh, with a reputation score. And so here's an example of a very simple dashboard. Um, but I think we need to go a little bit step farther, right? Which is yeah. you've got your reputation score, you've got your MPS score on the right, and the combination and uh, the what we call the normalization of data, right? So you've got your reviews reviews rankings. You got your social rankings. In this case, if uh, in the auto industry, there's always a CSI survey, uh, and then you get your MPS score all in one dashboard. Now the question is, can we figure out a way to give you predictive analytics on top of that to say, yeah. okay, how do we increase our MPS score? How do we increase our reputation score? And that is what we're all about. We're all focused on it. We just announced something called the Reputation Score X which is basically our ability to uh, give you prescriptive choices. So uh, in order to improve your rep score, you need to uh, solicit feedback at these points along the customer journey. Right. Um, in, in order to improve your MPS score, we think you should be more interactive around these points in the customer journey. And that I think is what the future is, right, Richard? I think you gotta have some tool that pulls the data in, gives you really good predictive uh, analytics so that you can make those choices because I don't think sitting around with a data warehouse team for hours and hours and hours is the right way to go. I think I think you got to have technology. Right. And 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 look, I, I, I'm old enough to remember the last time people thought it was a great idea to build all these things on their own. Um, and you know, that was that was the 80s people. And I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a loss as to why you know, one would simply put together, go back to programming and try and figure out how to stick all these things together. I think there are going to be excellent applications, as you say, that solve these problems. What you're looking at is multiple sources of data that can be pulled together very effectively. Now, how do we make all that data sing in a way that tells us where things are going in a crisp way? and get to the sort of diagnosis of opportunities and challenges. So what you're describing is really the next step in, in the whole evolution here. And, and look, these products that you're talking about that you guys have built, um, we're well on the road to accomplishing these objectives. It's not a case that, um, that we, we're, we're sort of 10 years out. I think it's, it's all right there to be had. I think what companies need to start thinking about though, and I think the big message is, is it's, it's not your father's NPS, right? You can't be thinking in terms of, we did a twice a year survey, great, we're cutting edge here and we're gonna really understand how to improve our business. The reality is competition's getting fierce, companies are getting good at this. The data-driven company of today is very astute at being able to use this kind of information to, to drive behavior. And they're gonna ring, run, run, run rings, I should say, around companies that, that can't adapt to that. I love your, uh, this is not your father's MPS. So there are people in our company that say grandfather's MPS. So uh, it's just kind of- make me feel old. Now, yeah, that, that's course, getting worse. now that I am a grandfather, uh, I already do feel old. So uh, 
I have three grandchildren already, Richard. Come on. Well, congratulations. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, as we look at um, what's going on, I mean, you, you live here in California with me, and, and it's such a crazy time if, in terms of um, we've got COVID-19 happening, and then we've also got all the fires and the smoke. It's like the perfect example of, okay, well, what would you do uh, relative to a CX program to adjust to something real time like this. I mean, this is not, uh, this has never happened before in the history of, of at least the United States, obviously. <laughs> but if you look around the world, I mean, these are real issues happening. And of course, here in California, we have the double whammy, right? Because you can't go outside right. and now you can't open your windows. So, and it's not a laughing matter. I'm just laughing at the chaos that you and I've been in for the last several weeks. But I think that's a good example of well, what, how do you see CX being more real-time to be able to adjust to this thing? And what do we see with COVID-19 as we move forward? So I, I think what's been fascinating is, uh, you know, fascinating in a rather grim way, of course, is been watching how the world has been impacted with this. And, and if you look at a bigger picture, major changes uh, have accelerated technology every time they've happened. Probably the last time we saw anything like this was before you and I were born, or, or maybe not in your instance, Joe, the Second World War. Um, and so that was a joke, by the way, and, and you're not that old. But, and, and you still have hair, so what am I to say? But yeah, still, I, because I have grandkids doesn't mean I lost it. The, the, the Second World War accelerated the development of technology rapidly. What we're seeing right now is the development, is an acceleration in, in adoption of technology. So we've been on a digital path for 30 odd years, right? Nicholas Necroponte at the MIT Media Lab wrote being digital, what, late 1980s? And, and sort of laid it out and said, look, everything's going digital, people. Um, we've been on this path a long time. What's changed all of a sudden is the businesses who were either resistant, reluctant, or incapable of embracing digital technologies woke up and said, we're out of business if we can't do digital tomorrow. Tomorrow, And so there's been this sort of madcap, wacky races effort to throw together digital for companies that were behind the curve. For those who were leaders already who'd invested for the last 10, 15 years, it's like payday. All of a sudden, you're making hay and your stock price is going up and the rest of the world is going down. So it's an overnight success based on 10 years of thoughtful planning and well put through strategies. What does that mean for the customer? Well, the customer is learning different ways of doing business, and those ways are going to stick to a degree. What we don't know is how much they're going to stick. But if you get used to the idea of engaging with companies in frictionless ways using electronic commerce or self-service, sure. you're not suddenly going to go, okay, it's the all clear on COVID. You know, I'm going to give all that up. Let me throw my smartphone away. It's time to head down to the local bank branch again. Yeah, These patterns will endure. So what does that mean for companies measuring CX? Well, first of all, we have to measure CX in a digital context. We have to be able to understand how customers experience the digital experience. Sure. If we don't know that, we're missing out not only on two-thirds of the experience, but where the future of the experience is. Yeah. Um, and so that's a big gap that's now being filled. Uh, we also have to deal with a generational shift of behavior uh, through, through age groups. And you know, you talk about social media, I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, you know, my son, who's 20 years old, has a different take on social media than I do, right? Yeah. I'm still coming to terms with TikTok. I have to say, I'm really struggling here, Joe, but I respect the fact that there is a generation that thinks it's the, the, the coolest thing imaginable. Well, just so, think about it. It's like, you know, the 10 second, uh, the 10 second commercial, you know, that's, that's right. why it's going over really well. Um, hey, Richard, we're coming up to the end of our 30 minutes. I just wanted to thank you today for participating with us. I also want to invite people that came to the uh, to the Fast Break series. Feel free to send us questions. Um, Richard and I will answer them. Uh, we'll, we'll put a link out on uh, the lovely LinkedIn, uh, and then they can click on it and then ask you and I both some questions. But you know, we really appreciate you coming on today and, and just kind of exploring these different avenues and of course. appreciate you doing it. Thank you. And, and you know, if people do send in questions, we could always adopt sort of presidential debate rules and just answer different questions 
We could. We can just answer <laughs> random questions. Uh, we can answer some questions we'd like to answer. <laughs> Okay, well, let's not get into politics, even though we're 30 days away, right? Anyways, well, thanks, Richard. We appreciate it. And uh, hope everybody has a great day and a great October. Take care.